Hello there, everybody. PT Pop here. All four lobes of my brain securely bound behind my back. And today is November 11th, 2021. And on this day, 20 years ago, something very traumatic happened to me that changed my working life and my world as an employee in the corporate world forever. Stay tuned. Hey, before I get to today's topic, I want to thank everybody who's made this channel possible. Right now, I have about 4,600 subscribers, and I appreciate each and every one of you. If you like this channel, you like my message, give my videos the thumbs up, subscribe, tell your friends, your, your call center survivor friends about me, because we can all commiserate together and maybe find a solution for a better better place, better way to live our lives, a better way to to work, to be employed, maybe a way to improve our lives as employees in the call center world. Um, I uh, just recently finished a documentary. I made a documentary about the life of fine artists here in Ohio. And I basically went down to the bustling art community in Dayton, Arizona. Or, sorry, Dayton, Arizona. Dayton, Ohio. I, I'm in Arizona now in my mind. Yeah. Um, Dayton, Ohio. And I met some wonderful people. Um, the film consists of Logan Rogers, Rusty Harden, myself, and a variety of other great individuals, including a great uh, a personality from PBS named Rodney Veal. And it's a great movie. It's about an hour and a half long. I have it for sale right now on my website for just $2.99. You can, it's my fall sale. Get it now while yours lasts. Or get it now while supplies last or whatever the saying is. I'm not very good at marketing, as you can tell. But go check out my movie. I think you'll enjoy it, especially if you've ever wanted to be an artist or have been an artist. So, so 21 years ago, 21 years ago and two months, I was hired by a company called or titled or named WorldCom. And WorldCom was at the time the largest data provider in the world. WorldCom merged with what was called MCI, which was Microwave Communications Incorporated, I believe it was. And they had the largest data backbone anywhere in the world, any company. And when I got hired by them, I was in heaven because I finally got a chance to work in data. And I finally got a chance to work for a big company and maybe move up and get promoted and things like that. And I was not familiar at all with data. I didn't know anything really about data at the time. I didn't know anything about computers at the time. And I remember during the interview process in the year 2000, uh, I told him, I said, I, I don't know anything about computers. I don't know anything about data circuits. And I, I told, I interviewed like eight people. And I, they even asked me, hey, interview with more people if you want. You want to talk to somebody about our switch, our digital switch, interview with them. I interviewed with everybody. I said, look, dudes, I don't know anything about data. They said, don't worry about it. You don't need to know anything about data. You just got to push trouble tickets. My job was called what is called a technical services manager. And I wore a pager. And anytime a major client's circuits went down, I'd get a page saying, hey, this guy's circuits went down. They're out of business. You got to call our, you know, you got to call our troubleshooting office and our data center with all the technicians in Cary, North Carolina and open up a ticket. And I was like, okay, if that's all I got to do is like, basically, they said, basically, you just got to babysit these grown men and women down in Cary, North Carolina and get them to push these tickets and get, get the tickets open to get these guys' circuits back up. And it was that simple. And I had eight clients and one of my biggest clients was Sherwin Williams. Another one was Eaton Corporation. I had TRW and D Bold Steel. Um, and a bunch of other places, Timken Steel, a couple of Timken uh, Steel companies. 
in uh, Diebold, not Diebold Steel, I'm sorry. Diebold was a data provider and provided networking for ATM machines around the country and monitored security on them and things like that. So anyway, my first year there, I, I, I really was struggling with this job because I really knew nothing about data. And so what happens is you get a trouble ticket, your pager goes off. This is back in the days of pagers before everybody had cell phones. I had a cell phone too, but I very rarely used it. But back in the day, you get a page, you call these texts in Cary, North Carolina, say, hey, Sherwin Williams store just lost all data connections. Their cash registers are down there, you know. Paint is sitting on the docks, man. Paint is sitting on the docks. Get your asses in gear and get work on the circuits. Well, if you've ever dealt with computer guys, predominantly men, there's women in the, in, in the industry too now, but back then they really weren't. It was all a male dominated the industry. They give you attitude because they knew right away I didn't know what I was talking about. So I'd call in there and I'd say, hey, you know, Joe, uh, tech, tech, tech Joe, Sherwin Williams circuits are down. You got to get them back up and working. He's like, okay, I just pinged their router and I've got connectivity between, you know, our office and their router. There's nothing wrong with the circuits. They're completely up working. I was like, well, they're telling me they're, they're bouncing. The circuits are bouncing. Anyway, long story short was these guys knew I didn't know what I was talking about. And they basically blew me off. And it was like talking to the wall. They wouldn't listen to me. And I kept asking these people for training. I said, I need some more training. I, I don't know what I'm talking about. I still don't know the one end of data circuit for my left leg. They're like, well, don't worry about it. You're, you're doing fine. You're doing fine. Long story short, even though I didn't know what I was talking about my first year there, I made $72,000. Now, this is 20 years ago. And at the end of my second year, I was I was told I was going to make, with bonuses and everything, about 100000 and uh, as some of you may or may not know, the story behind WorldCom is that they were doing some creative accounting. They were doing something called cooking the books. And their CEO and president, Bernie Ebers, was basically making it look like they're making more money than they really were. Or they were making less money than they were. I don't remember which it was. Probably making less money than they really were. And he got caught. And um, I didn't know any of this. I didn't know any of that stuff was going on behind the scenes. But it was it was November 11th, 2001, two months to the day after 9-11 happened, that the axe fell. And about a month prior to the axe falling, I got these emails from my boss who was in Columbus who said, hey, you know, you've got to come to this really important meeting on November 11th that you can't miss it. You've got to come. It's, it's a mandatory meeting. Everybody's got to go. And I showed up at work and it was kind of like in that movie office space. I got called into a room with two people I'd never seen before. And they're like, Hey, I'm sorry, Mr. Tompkins, we're, we're having layoffs. And, uh, unfortunately we're having to let you go today. That whole, that whole thing. And they literally gave me a box and I didn't have much at my desk. I mean, I just had a few things and they walked me out the door. I was stunned. I was really stunned. I, I did not like the job. It wasn't a, wasn't nearly as bad as a call center job. It had a lot of prestige. I had a nice little cubicle and I got to go to work and rub elbows with chief information officers of major corporations headquartered here in um, Ohio. But I was stunned. I was completely just blown away. Part of me was relieved in a, in a sense because I didn't know what I was doing. I, I had no clue what I was doing, even after a year of being there. And it really bothered me. Literally almost overnight, as I'm trying to get my resume together and find another job, and I signed up for unemployment and all that stuff, I, real, I found out that everything was digital. I had no clue. Like I went down to, at the time, what was called Ameritech which was the local phone company. And in the old days, you could go down there to this big tower. They had a big, like, 30-story 30, 30 tower that you would go, that you'd work out of. And um, you just walk into the HR department, fill out an application, give me a resume, and they would take it and say, we'll call you if we have anything available. Well, I drove all the way to down. This is in downtown Cleveland. And the building was in downtown Cleveland. I drove downtown Cleveland, which is about 15 miles from my condo. And I walk in, and this kind of security guard stops me. He's like, what are you doing? And I said, I'm here to apply for a job. I just want to file an application. He goes, oh, no, 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 we, we don't do that anymore. 
I said, what do you mean? He goes, it's all done online. And I'm like, online? But what's online? And she's like, on the internet. And I'm like, on the internet? I mean, I knew what the internet was, but like nobody had it. I mean, I didn't have it. I didn't even own a computer at the time. He's like, yeah, you're going to go home, create an account, and submit your resume electronically. I'm like, electronically? I mean, all I had, you know, I had a couple copies of my, hard copies of my resume in my hand. So I was in panic. I, you know, I'm trying to figure out how to apply to jobs now because, it, you know, everywhere I, everywhere I went, they said, no, no you got to apply online. We don't, we don't take applications in person anymore. Literally within, within a month of me getting laid off, uh, this is what I ran into. So I had to run out and buy a computer. Jesus Christ, dude, you fucking idiot. And I bought a compact computer. It had a Celeron processor, which I didn't even know what a Celeron processor was till years later when I found out. It's just, it's just a piece of garbage processor. When I got laid off from WorldCom, it was both a really bad time, horrible time, and a good time. Number one, it was horrible because it took me six months to find a job. It was good because it forced me to learn about computers. And it forced me to try to do what I really wanted to do, which was work in the arts. I was at this juncture in my life where, where I had been applying and applying to jobs. I finally got an offer from a phone company where a friend of mine had worked for like 10 years. He and I used to work together in telecom. He's like, yeah, come on, come on, come on board with us. They're going to pay me like 32 grand a year. And I also had an opportunity to go to work out in Phoenix, Arizona, because I had always wanted to move to Phoenix. I, I had wanted to move to Phoenix for about five years at this point. And uh, this guy's like, yeah, come work for us. He made me an offer for about 32 grand a year. This is 20 years ago. And I was thrilled. I'm like, oh yeah, I finally found a job in the same industry. But I was gonna have to drive like 25 miles into Akron, Ohio to work. And I, I despise the city of Akron. Sorry, Akron people, but it's just, ugh, I don't care. LeBron James is from there. I'm not real crazy about Akron. And I was just dreading the idea of having to drive to downtown Akron every day to go to work for this guy in this dirty, dreary city. I had been looking at moving to Phoenix. I, while I had been laid off, I also flew out to Phoenix and I interviewed with a company named SureGuard. And SureGuard was a company that was a, you know, they sold storage. They sold storage to people around, you know, that were moving out of their apartments. They, you know, what do you call it? Self storage. It was a self storage company. Brand new company. It was a call center position. They're going to pay me like $28,000 a year to sell storage to people over the telephone. So I would have to move to Phoenix. So I've moved to Gilbert, Arizona, which is a, a suburb of Phoenix. Uh, south, south, southeast of Phoenix, and I would sit in a call center and, and get people to sign up for lockers over the phone. And I'm like, Akron, we're from Telecom, moved to Phoenix and sell storage. Akron, Telecom, Phoenix, storage. Phoenix, sunny weather, beautiful mountains, beautiful women, brand new homes. Homes were really cheap back then, too. Really cheap. And I elected, after a lot of deep contemplation and thinking and wrestling with it, I did elect to move to Phoenix. So when I got from WorldCom, I was given a couple options to get, you know, get back to work in the communications industry or to start blaze my own trail. And I elected to blaze my own trail. I moved to Phoenix, which really started my nightmare of call centers. Um, that being said, SureGuard, the call center, SureGuard was not a bad place. That's the one I don't think I've ever talked about SureGuard. SureGuard call center was on the second floor of a brand new building in Gilbert, Arizona, off of Gilbert Road. It's either off of Gilbert or Arizona Avenue, which I'm pretty sure it was Gilbert. And brand spanking new facility. We, we were on the second floor above where all the storage spaces were. Brand new call center, brightly lit windows, uh, they had this really cool uh, fabric hanging from the ceilings that was white that reflected the light in from the windows. Very bright, white, and airy. It was an easy industry. It was an easy product to understand. 
And my boss was amazing. My boss was just fabulous. He was, his name was Mike Cristiano. And I love this guy. I, I don't mean literally like romantic love, but as a, as a manager, he was great. And I say he was great because he was so positive. See, I'm the type of employee that I need encouragement to improve. And I need kind of somebody to, to be decent to me, not ride me and be a dick to me. And he, he was always nice to me. He, he would always compliment me. And I remember in my call reviews with him, he'd sit me down, and this is back in the day of cassette recorders, cassette tapes. He'd take a cassette tape into a room with me and we'd listen to my calls. And go, oh, you've got, you've got such a nice voice, Pete. You, you're really good on the phones. And he'd build me up. He'd say, you, you need some improvements here and here and here. And then he'd end it again with a positive. Oh, you've got a great voice, you're doing well. Just pick it up a bit and be a little bit more assertive and you'll, you'll do fine. He was so friendly, he was so nice, you know, he'd say hi to me, it, you know, be friendly, come up, see how I was doing, a pat on the back, stuff like that. And I think he's the only manager I ever had that was really, really awesome in the call center industry. But also, after I got laid off from WorldCom, and when I decided to move to Phoenix, I had to sell my condo. When I sold my condo, whatever proceeds I made from the sale, the house had to go into my bank. And that's where my wife worked. My wife worked in the bank where I had all my money, my millions. And uh, she was amazing. This is how I met my wife. I met my wife because of getting laid off from WorldCom because I sold the condo. Moving away from Cleveland was a blessing because I hated Cleveland at the time. I couldn't stand being there. Cleveland was dreary, dark, formidable. There were no jobs. The people still are fat and you know, overweight. Cigarette smoking, beer swilling, Cleveland Browns fans that just live, sleep, and die over the city. And I couldn't take it anymore. I was done with it. I was done with the flannel gray skies that rolled in off the lake in November, like they are right now. They, you know, these flannel gray skies entomb the city for six months. You never see the sun. It's constantly cold. At least in 2004, we got married in June of 04, and we uh, lived in Phoenix for about 10 years. We lived in uh, the suburb of Phoenix. And uh, it all got started. The whole thing got started because I got laid off from WorldCom. And if I hadn't gotten laid off from WorldCom, I wouldn't have met my wife. I wouldn't have ever become an artist. I wouldn't have ever gotten into photography. I don't think many of the things that have happened for me would have happened. So that that is how I ended up working at call centers. This is um, my, my getting laid off from WorldCom started my path and started my corporate life going down the call center thing because once I worked once once I worked at SureGuard the only thing I could find were call center jobs and I had SureGuard on my resume I had telecom but there were no telecom companies out there there, there was a couple but they weren't hiring ever and all of a sudden I was trapped working in all of these call center jobs I bounced all over the place because I kept thinking, well, there's got to be one good call center out of all these places. The story basically is how I got my start working in the corporate call center environment. Even though I would worked in one before in the mid-90s, it was nothing like the big call centers out west. So, there you have it. So, if you like my videos, give me the thumbs up. Hit the subscribe button, tell your friends, tell your wives, tell the kids, wake the cat, tell them about my channel. Have a good day. PT Pop, signing off. Bye.